Be sure and join us in the History Guy Guild at the historyguyguild.locals.com. In the 19th century, travel by rail had its share of dangers. The United States added some 170,000 miles of train track between 1871 and 1900, and that dramatically increased the chance of death by train. One town, Ashtabula, Ohio, was becoming a bustling railway stop between New York and the West when disaster struck. The Ashtabula Bridge Disaster of December 1876 would spark change not just in the town, but also in the railroad industry and with government regulation. The worst rail disaster in the United States in the 19th century deserves to be remembered. Ashtabula, Ohio has a population today of about 18,000. Situated on the northernmost border of Ohio on the Lake Erie shoreline, the city has a harbor and a significant maritime heritage. In the 19th century, the train station in Ashtabula was a stopping point between New York and Chicago with convenient access to the Great Lakes. Industrialization caused growth in the community. The population more than doubled between 1870 and 1880. In the late 19th century, thousands of miles of railroad tracks were laid in Ohio, many of them thanks to industrialist Amasis Stone. Stone was born in 1818, the ninth child of a farmer in Massachusetts. He became a successful carpenter by the age of 21 when he began working for his brother-in-law, William Howe, a construction contractor. Howe invented a design for a truss, an engineering structure used to support weight that could be used for railroad bridges. Stone and an investor purchased the rights to use Howe's truss for a sum of $40,000, the equivalent of over a million dollars today. Described as stern, proud, and stubborn, Stone became a hugely successful businessman, the most prominent bridge builder of the East Coast, and built what many called a railway empire in Ohio and beyond. As the president of the Cleveland, Painesville, and Ashtabula Railroad, CP&A for short, Stone decided to replace a 300-foot wooden bridge over the Ashtabula River with a new all-iron Howe truss design. The basics of the Howe truss include upper and lower parallel beams that are called cords. Connecting the two cords are vertical posts, and diagonally between them are the braces and counterbraces, which rest on and are bolted to angled blocks. This simple design allowed panels of the bridge to be completed off-site and transported to the bridge location, or to be completed with minimal tooling on-site. According to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a Howe truss bridge should span no more than about 150 feet because of the stress that it places on the panels. However, Stone's new bridge was to be 154 feet. Stone also wanted it to be entirely made of iron, whereas up to this point, Howe truss bridges were typically constructed of partially wood and partially iron. The designer he chose to flesh out his plans, Joseph Tomlinson, disagreed with many of Stone's bridge elements. An all-iron bridge would be heavier, lowering the payload it could carry, and the beams were undersized for the load. So the men parted ways, and Stone made the changes himself. He also edited the end panels to have fewer posts and braces. Keeping the manufacturing in the family, Stone contracted with the mill that his brother managed for the I-beams and raw iron. The cast iron and wrought iron were then fabricated by CP&A. When building began, the construction supervisor planned for a 5.7-inch camber. That's the upward curvature which straightens under a load, but Stone had this reduced to 3.5 inches, meaning the upper cords were now too long. Workers compensated by shaving them down. As the temporary support work was being removed, the bridge began to sag 2.5 inches below horizontal, so the false work was replaced and the camber adjusted to the original plans, not by replacing the I-beams, but by shimming them. As the building supports were removed for the second time, the bridge buckled in several places. Stone reached out to the chief engineer in charge of the railroad, Charles Collins. Collins had originally been told that he should concentrate on other bridges being built, a perceived snub by Stone. So knowing little of the construction, he begrudgingly came to see if he could help, and determined that the I-beams had been installed on their sides. The workers had to remove them and turn them 90 degrees. Additional supports were added, and on the third try, with the help of shims, the bridge withheld the tests of three or four locomotives, crossing at speed, and also stationary locomotives. In July of 1865, three years after its initial planning began, the bridge was completed. Railroads were no stranger to accidents in this period. As rail traffic increased, the local and federal governments didn't have regulations in effect. Railroad companies didn't have to report to anyone, and inspections weren't mandated. According to the Ohio History webpage, Ohio History Central, railway companies were more concerned about profit than safety. 
1973, 210 people died in rail accidents in Ohio, with another 398 injured. In 1900, over 500 people were killed, and another 7,000 injured. On December 29, 1876, conditions were extreme in the Northeast. Temperatures were well below freezing, and over 20 inches of snow had fallen throughout the day, with gusty winds causing what the webpage Weather and Radar describes as a blinding blizzard. The Lakeshore Michigan Southern Railroad Train No. 5, known as the Pacific Express, an elegantly appointed train consisting of two engines, two each of baggage and express cars, three coaches, a smoking car, and three sleepers, was over two hours late as it approached the Astabula Station at 7.30 p.m. Because the bridge was only about a thousand feet before the station, engineers would cut off steam a bit before the bridge and coast across into the station. As the first engine was clearing the bridge, the driver heard a crack and felt the train slipping backwards. He threw open the throttle, and as the bridge collapsed, the coupling snapped between the two engines, allowing the first engine to remain on solid ground. But the second engine, and the express cars behind, fell with the bridge to the icy cold snow covered river 75 feet below. The rest of the cars were then pulled into the chasm, one after another, crashing into or on top of each other below. Accounts vary as to how many people were aboard. The Chicago Tribune noted that survivors suggested far more were aboard than railway officials acknowledged. Most agree it was in the range of about 160 to 170 total, with trained personnel and passengers. One survivor, J.E. Birchall, described the event. The first thing I heard was a cracking in the front part of the car, and then the same cracking in the rear. Then came another cracking in the front, louder than the first, and then came a sickening oscillation and a sudden sinking, and I was thrown stunned from my seat. I heard the cracking and splintering and smashing around me. The ironwork bent and twisted like snakes, and everything took horde shapes. I heard a lady scream in anguish, Oh, help me! Then I heard the cry of fire. Someone broke a window, and I pushed out the lady who had screamed. Another survivor, Marion Shepard, told the Winfield Telegram of Winfield, Kansas, I can't describe the noise. There were all sorts of sounds. I could hear above a, a sharp ringing sound, as if all the glass on the train were being shattered to pieces. Someone cried out, We are going down! And at that moment, all the lights in the car went out. I felt the car floor sinking under my feet. The sensation of falling was very apparent. I thought of a great many things, and I made up my mind that I was going to be killed. She escaped, having to climb over the roof of another car. The car was dark inside, she said, and oh, what heart-rendering groans issued from it. The scene was horrible. Birchall continued, the train lay in the valley in the water, our car a little on its side, both ends broken in. The rest of the train lay in every direction, some on end, some on the side, crushed and broken, a terrible but picturesque sight. Below were the water and broken ice. Seventy feet above was the broken bridge. The victims not only had to deal with the crash, but now the freezing weather and, even more frightening, fire in the wreckage. As the cars collapsed, the lamps and heating stoves within quickly ignited fires. Virgil said, the snow in the valley was nearly to my waist. I could only move with difficulty. The wreck was then on fire. The wind was blowing from the east and whirling blinding masses of snow over the terrible ruin. The crackling of the flames, the whistling wind, the screaming of the hurt made a pandemonium of the little valley. And the water of the freezing creek was red with blood or black with flying cinders. Those who could escape the wreckage in the first precious minutes. The Stark County Democrat of Canton, Ohio wrote, It seems the falling train and bridge mashed the ice in the creek, and those not killed in the fall or burnt up by the burning cars were held down by the wreck and drowned before they could be extricated. Many, too, will be or have been frozen. With the surviving engineer ringing his bell and blowing the whistle repeatedly, a handful of rescuers showed up quickly. Citizens of the city heard the crash and came to help, carrying the injured the quarter mile to the nearest hotel. The Stark County Democrat continues, All the large-hearted citizens of Ashtabula are at the wreck, and as many as can are working to rescue those not already claimed by death. A true horror of the night was the thieves that took advantage of the mayhem, stealing from the injured. The Chicago Tribune gave the example of a Mr. J.W. Smith of Toronto, Canada, who was known to have received the evening before a registered letter and $7,000 in money. This pocket was found with the telegram and registered letter, but the money was gone. This was, the paper surmised, indication of the presence upon the scene of the disaster of experienced robbers. Help from the fire department took longer because of the blizzard conditions. The fire chief allegedly showed up drunk and refused to fight the fire on the grounds that it was futile. And so a bucket brigade was formed by those that disagreed while the fire engine with a hand pump and steam pump went unused. But their efforts could not save those pinned by the wreckage. And onlookers watched in horror as the fire consumed the entire train from one end to the other. 
The official record lists 92 people killed and 64 injured. Someone survived from each car except the second. Accounts from passengers suggest that the train was quite full, with a seating capacity of over 200, and that seats were hard to find. But as the intensity of the fire burned the bodies to the point that, for some, all that remained were bones or indistinguishable burnt lumps, the exact number will never be known. The Stark County Democrat said of some of the mangled and burned bodies, no one could suspect that they had ever been human beings. Reverend Stephen Pete, a resident of Astabula who had come to help rescue that night and had searched for personal items, later wrote an account of the passengers on the train from front to back and was able to give names to many of those who had died. The weather slowed the news of the accident. The Stark County Democrat noted that snow has been falling almost constantly for 48 hours, making it very difficult to get news from the wrecked and burning train. When word reached Cleveland by telegraph, a relief train was loaded with railroad officials, surgeons, and medical supplies, and worried friends and family of passengers known to be on the train. Among them was Charles Collins, the chief engineer who had not been involved with construction, but yet was responsible for safety and inspections for the railroad. For several days afterwards, workers and townspeople dug through the debris and snow, first for the dead, and then to search for personal items that might identify any of those deceased. The Quad City Times of Davenport, Iowa, noted the funeral of one of the dead, Davenport businessman J.A. Aldrich. The sermon was preached without corpse or coffin, no vestige of the missing man's body having been found, save a small pin cushion which he'd carried for several years. A sad funeral, truly, when loved friends are not permitted to look on the face of the dead, whom they had searched for faithfully among the mangled passengers of the ill-fated train. The paper mentioned another victim of the accident from the Quad Cities, a Dr. Hubbard, who was identified only by his watch chain, which remained upon his otherwise unrecognizable body. On December 31st, because there was no coroner in Ashtabula, a coroner's jury was appointed consisting of six men who took testimony from 53 people, including both locomotive engineers and the rear brakemen, members of the Ashtabula Fire Department, passengers, civil engineers, and builders over two months. The report was submitted at the beginning of March 1877 and concluded that the disaster and deaths were caused by the poorly designed and constructed bridge that was not properly inspected. The failure of the train to have self-extinguishing stoves as mandated by state law eight years prior, and the failure of the fire department to even attempt to fight the fire. Amasa Stone, who was in Europe at the time of the disaster, was held responsible for the bridge, the railroad for the inspections and stoves, and Fire Chief Knapp was charged with responsibility for the fire. On January 1st, the Ohio State Legislature appointed a committee of senators and representatives to investigate the disaster. They amassed reports from civil engineers, testimony from railroad officials, including Amosis Stone and Charles Collins, and were granted full access to the coroner jury's information. Their findings were shared on January 30th and put the blame on the design and construction of the bridge, the failure of the inspectors to properly inspect it, and allegedly the materials were faulty. This committee drafted a bill that would have regulated design code and required inspections by civil engineers, but the Ohio legislature didn't rule on the bill. A third independent investigation, possibly commissioned by the American Society of Civil Engineers, reported that a poorly cast lug had failed, causing the collapse. This investigation also blamed a general lack of knowledge regarding the strength of iron and the infrequent inspections by men not qualified for the job. Charles Collins, after testifying before the Legislative Committee, was found dead in his home with a gunshot to the head. Popular belief at the time was that he was so grief-stricken that he committed suicide. It was a year and a half later, in November of 1878, that the New York Times reported that the death was being investigated as a murder. Nothing seems to have come to the investigation, however, as, due to his connection with the bridge disaster, the website Northwest Pennsylvania Stories notes, public sentiment surrounding his death was not much aggrieved. Amosis Stone did commit suicide several years later, in May of 1883. He was said to be both in failing health and failing businesses, but many contended that it was guilt over the bridge disaster that eventually drove him to shoot himself through the heart. Modern analysis suggests that inspection might not have prevented the disaster. Metal fatigue, the frigid temperatures, the poor construction of the cords, and poor design for the iron angle blocks all contributed to the bridge's collapse. At the time, Americans were horrified to hear that the incompetence of the railroad company to build a safe bridge directly caused the unnecessary loss of so many lives. In 1887, a decade after the disaster, Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act, which regulated the railroad industry and established a commission to investigate fatal accidents. Civil engineers stopped using cast iron for load-bearing structures. Railroads started using steam pipes rather than coal stoves to heat cars, and the people of Astabula built an emergency care clinic, realizing that they didn't have medical facilities in the case of a large accident. 
They opened a general hospital in 1904. And on January 19th, 1877, 145 years ago today, the people of Astabula buried the still unidentified remains, the unknown victims of what papers at the time called the Astabula Horror. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.